Today we're going to take a look at the Ruger GP100 model number 1753, sometimes referred to as the Wiley Clap model. There are certain guns that I remember hearing about or seeing well before I became the firearms enthusiast I am today that made an impression enough for me to say, I'm going to buy that gun someday. Sometimes they're kind of random, like the North American Arms Mini Revolver that I lusted after for years after seeing it in a magazine before I was of legal age to even purchase one. The Wiley Clap GP100 models were definitely among that list. There was just something about the no-nonsense, all-business, utilitarian look of a 357 built for fighting that really drew me in, even before I knew what that really was or its practical application. I hemmed and hawed about getting one for years, because after all, I didn't really need one. But in the early stages of the craziness of 2020, I found one in stock and grabbed it, because I needed something to panic about after all. Let's take a minute and go over some of the basics. The GP100 is, of course, one of the iconic revolvers of the past several decades. It was introduced in 1985 as the evolution of Ruger's Security 6 line, and is known for its durability, relative simplicity, and ease of maintenance. It has been produced in a number of calibers, barrel lengths, sighting configurations, etc. throughout the years, and is made from a blued carbon or stainless steel. It's hard to pin down an exact date, but sometime around 2010, Ruger and Tallow distributors collaborated with renowned gun writer Wiley Clapp to do a couple wheel guns deemed by Mr. Clapp to have the right specs and features for a simple and practical defensive firearm. There were a couple of models, a stainless version with Novak fiber optic sights and a blued one with Novaks in a brass bead like this one here. The guns were supposed to be fairly limited editions, but it seems that Ruger and Tallow sort of skirted around that and have been making them fairly steadily over the past decade. This model, the 1753, is no longer referred to in Ruger's catalog as the Wiley Clap Edition, just as its model number, but I will still refer to it as the Wiley Clap throughout this video. As mentioned, this GP100 has a matte blue finish over alloy, a 3-inch barrel, Novak low mount sights with a brass bead front, a contoured and beveled frame and cylinder, and one-piece synthetic rubber grips with wood inserts. Its overall length is 8.5 inches, and it weighs in at a hefty 36 ounces. It has the standard GP100 capacity of 6 rounds. The GP100 gets its reputation for durability in part due to its triple locking system, in which the cylinder is locked into the frame at the front, rear, and bottom. I'm not going to tell you that I have shot thousands of heavy 357 loads through this in the past year, but it only takes a cursory search of the web to see anecdotes from many very good shooters and experienced lawmen about the GP100's tank-like ability to eat full house magnums for a very long time and not be any worse for the wear. It just feels solid. I love Smith K-frames and I own several, but a GP100 just feels like a different animal. Ergonomically, I personally don't love the grips that come on the Wiley Clap. Since I have fairly small hands, I seem to shoot revolvers better with shorter, smaller grips. I don't know if that's just in my head or if it makes sense, but I will probably try out a set of the Altamont compacts on this gun at some point, which will also help me out in concealment. Other than that, it points well for me and its weight really helps in stability and recoil management, and conversely staying on target. The Novak sights work great. They're simple, durable, and can be picked up in various lighting conditions though my preference for a front sight is something that pops a little more than a brass bead. I may upgrade to a tritium front at some point in the future when funds allow. I wish more revolvers came standard with Novaks, as they are easy to switch out for different configurations. I'm a little underwhelmed by the trigger on this GP. Maybe because I'm spoiled by my old K-frames and my broken-in new Model 66 and even my Berettas. Out of the box, it was pretty gritty, and after several thousand trigger presses, it smoothed up a little, but it's really not great, and I'm really not picky with triggers, it just feels clunky. I have heard most Ruger revolvers need some cleaning and slicking up, but I just haven't had the time or motivation to take it apart and really give the internals a good once over. I think for getting close to a thousand big ones once all is said and done, Ruger could send these out with better triggers, but that's just me. I can shoot it pretty well relative to my other wheel guns and find that it soaks up recoil with the hotter loads noticeably better than my Smith Model 66. The sights on mine were pretty much dead on for my 158 grain loads. I am up to about 700 rounds on the WC at this point, maybe about 150 of these being 357s. With the 3 inch tube, I think that a lot of the more available, that's pre-2020, 
loads for 357 Magnum are a little bit much for defensive use in terms of increased bark and not much of a return on bite with shorter barrels. There is a sweet spot between upper level 38 plus P and lower level 357 that would be ideal for these short barrel 357s. I've been carrying Buffalo Boar 158 grain 38 plus P, which is a simple proven load that does around 1,140 feet per second out of a 3 inch barrel, which translates to around 450 foot pounds. Certainly not bad. If I did carry 357s, it would be the Spear Gold Dot short barrel, which actually is moving a little slower than the Buffalo Boar 38. The majority of the ammo I have shot through my Wiley Clap has been 38 plus P reloads with 158 grain lead semi wad cutters or Barry's plated round nose, along with a few boxes of standard pressure 38s and three boxes of commercial 158 grain and 125 grain 357s that I had lying around. I have not had a single issue from a reliability standpoint that isn't just a normal revolver issue. A lot of folks who don't have experience with wheel guns think that nothing can beat the reliability of a revolver. While this is true in some cases, especially when we're talking about a very clean gun, if you're at the range putting a decent amount of ammo through the gun, unburned powder flecks and other debris will cause issues in pretty short order. It's just the way they're designed, and there's really no way around it. I can usually feel a trigger pull getting sluggish after around 100 rounds with pretty much any revolver I have. Obviously, this is going to be very dependent on the quality of the ammo you're shooting, a lot of the reloads I shoot use unique powder, which is fairly dirty. I make sure I have a toothbrush on hand and give underneath the ejector star a good scrub down as soon as I start to notice a revolver feeling a little bit off, and usually that solves the problem. Bottom line is that if you've got a clean, functioning gun and no high primers, the chances of a revolver working when you need it are pretty dang good. But if you're shooting a high round count class, expect to be performing some basic cleaning and maintenance over the course of the day. Revolvers aren't Glocks. I've carried the GP here and there around town, and quite a bit while out wandering the woods. I've got a few different setups I'm testing out. A JM Custom Appendix Holster, a Galco Summer Comfort IWB Holster, and my trusty Hill People Gear Kit Bag. If you're looking for a dedicated concealed carry piece, I recommend you look at something else. It takes a certain kind of weirdo like myself to want to carry a 36-ounce, six-shot wheel gun around inside the waistband. The height of the stock grips make it pretty much impossible to conceal without dressing around the gun. As stated before, I'll probably change that pretty soon, and I don't think that I'll have much problem carrying an appendix once that happens, as I've been concealing larger autos and K-frames in that position for several years now with no real problems. All in all, I like the gun a lot. I think it might be a little bit overpriced, but there isn't really any other revolver options that get you to the same place in terms of a 3-inch barrel, swappable sights, and a decent warranty from a reputable company if you're looking for a practical, mid-sized defensive revolver. I'm looking forward to putting it through its paces and learning more about it over the coming years. Thanks for watching this video, folks, and stay safe out there.